All right. So how do you go about starting a crowdsourcing project? Well, I started with a shawl. I was going through some old exhibition files when I found one that basically said, when Carrie McDonald was a young girl, she made this shawl with the help of her mother using some wool from their neighbor's sheep. How interesting. It's so rare we have something made by children in the collection. I wonder if it's any good. Here's a close-up of the shawl. That's a pretty intricate feather and fan pattern. I'm guessing this wasn't her first project. From the catalog record, I found out that her mother's name was Harriet and her father's name was Donald. That's right, Donald McDonald. I saw that the neighbor with the sheep was Mr. McKay and the donor of the shawl was Mrs. T. W. Dent. I was very pleased to find out her father's name because this meant I might be able to find out some more information about her. Canterbury Museum has a wonderful resource called the G.R. McDonald Dictionary of Canterbury Biographies, or the McDonald Dictionary for short. I should note that there's no relation between G.R. McDonald and Donald McDonald. They spell their names differently. For those of you unfamiliar with the McDonald Dictionary, you might be wondering why I wouldn't just look for Carrie's name in the dictionary. That's because the dictionary is mainly organized by the male heads of the household. The dictionary was presented to Canterbury Museum in 1964. This is a photo from the museum's annual report from that year. You can see a tall, bespectacled George Renald MacDonald reading one of the biography cards to a board member and our archivist librarian, John C. Wilson. George started the project back in 1952. At first, he just intended to write biographies for some of the portraits in our photographic collection, but the scope soon expand to include anyone he could find information about who lived in the 19th century in Canterbury. 12 years later, and he had biographies for over 12,000 people. Some people had just one line, and others had biographies that spanned several index cards. There are over 22,000 index cards in the collection. And as you can see, they were originally stored in metal drawers. I should mention that George volunteered his time for this project, receiving encouragement from our then director, Roger Duff. The dictionary was considered very progressive at the time it was donated, because it included people from all social classes. But you have to keep in mind that MacDonald was writing about 19th century people in the 1950s and 1960s. So while people from all social classes are included, which is progressive, there are very few Maori and women who have their own biography card. In the early 1990s, when Canterbury Museum was preparing an exhibition to mark the centennial of women's suffrage, someone went through and counted all the women who have their own biography card. They came up with 64. No one's done a count of how many Maori have their own individual biography card, but I'm sure it's equally as low. However, women aren't completely absent from the other thousands of index cards in the dictionary. They're just not indexed because they're not the head of the household or a public figure. And that's why I look for Carrie on her father's card. Here is page one of Donald McDonald's biography. There's his wife Harriet mentioned twice on the first page. Since all the cards were written out by hand, George invented shortcuts to make it faster such as M-A-R-R -R for married, or D-A-U for daughter. Now this is where I got excited, because I noticed that his daughter Flora married T.W. Dent, which means she's Mrs. T.W. Dent, and Flora is the donor of the shawl. On to page two of Donald's biography. There's Harriet again, and Flora, and Flora's husband. But who's this? Caroline Hewson McDonald. Could Carrie be short for Caroline? To figure that out, I could check some of George's sources, such as the family Bible, referenced here on the second page. Or, at the bottom of the first page, there are some newspaper references. There's a list that explains all these abbreviations. And using this list, I can see that these are newspaper references to the Littleton Times from the 20th and 21st of July, 1906, and it happens to be Donald's obituary. Now, the Littleton Times isn't digitized to 1906 yet, but 
while I was on Papers Past, I found Carrie's obituary in another newspaper, and I did in fact confirm that she was Caroline. Using the dictionary can be a bit like solving a puzzle between deciphering the handwriting and the abbreviations. In the past, people had to come to the museum to look at the dictionary, and they could look at the printed list of abbreviations and see the index with the list of women's biographies at the front. There was also a subject index, so you could find a list of all the people connected to city council or whatever it is that you were looking for. This was a good resource for the few people who could make their way to Christchurch and to the museum. Now we've put it online with Creative Commons licensing so that anyone with internet access can potentially look at the cards. So we've greatly increased our potential audience, but we've actually decreased access to the finding aids. You can still search for all the people that were indexed, that's under associated person now, but the list of abbreviations and the subject index isn't available online. Sure, we could put PDFs of these documents online, but that isn't really making the best use of collections online, and it doesn't really reflect how people want to do research today. They expect to be able to type in Carrie McDonald and come up with all the documents, objects, photos that are related to that person. And wouldn't it be better if you could just click on a link and go straight to Donald's obituary on Papers Past? It would be amazing. But then you remember that there are over 22,000 individual index cards and you get overwhelmed. But then you get excited because you realize that the McDonald Dictionary is perfect for a crowdsourcing project. And a crowdsourcing project driven by volunteer contributions is very much in keeping with Donald's original project. I just hope it doesn't take us 12 years. Making the project a reality is where Chris and our project intern, Phoebe Fordyce, come in. So I'll hand over to Chris now. Kia ora koutou. Um, thank you for having uh, us here to talk about this. So as Joanna said, um, uh, we uh, got uh, excited about the possibilities for um, uh, crowdsourcing some of this information and running it as a student project. Um, and that conversation really began um, at uh, one of a series of meetups that we uh, have been running at the University of Canterbury uh, for people interested in digital humanities and for those uh, from the cultural heritage uh, uh, kind of areas in, in Christchurch and the region. Um, we've been running these um, kind of monthly, except for the months where we don't run them. Um, so they've been a little bit, <laughs> a little bit ad hoc throughout this year, but um, they have been a really fantastic way to kind of connect up people from different areas and um, uh, sort of join, join up interests. Um, they've been run by a couple of um, post-grad research associates of the Arts Digital Lab at, at, um, at Canterbury. Um, including Cara, who's pictured at the top here. She spoke at last year's NDF, um, and she's, she's uh, gesturing to a cat meme here that says the future is meow, uh, in case you can't read it. Um, so we, we do some fun stuff, um, and um, this is really the, the sort of setting where Joanna and I kind of uh, talked about the McDonald Dictionary as a, as a potential um, sort of crowdsourcing uh, project. Um, we have a, a program called Professional and Community Engagement at the University of Canterbury uh, where students can do an internship that is um, uh, both sort of underpinned uh, by at some academic work uh, but where they get to work with um, a partner from industry or the community on a specific project uh, and do some, some practical hands-on kind of stuff. Um, so we set up um, a, an internship project around this um, but really we wanted to sort of ask well kind of critically examine, is this actually a good idea? What, what would we want to get out of it? Um, what specifically would we want to transcribe? How would we want to make that available? And kind of answer some of those questions, as well as really answering um, how would this work as a teaching project? Um, I sympathise or um, related to what um, Hakan will said about um, uh, being a person who doesn't have very many colleagues around them who knows what they do. Sometimes I feel a little bit like that um, in uh, teaching uh, and doing research in digital humanities. Um, and uh, so um, we, we wanted to sort of see if this really was a, a good idea. Uh, and Canterbury Museum's interest in transcribing the many names of uh, women mentioned in the dictionary also provided a natural sort of intellectual uh, focus uh, for the project and thinking about 
crowdsourcing both in practical terms but also in terms of um, feminist history and having a kind of a, a focused approach uh, or a, um, a direction to our, um, our, our aim for our crowdsourcing work. So um, we found a great intern, um, Phoebe, and we made her do a number of things as part of the project. She had to uh, transcribe a number of the index cards in full in order to kind of get a sense of um, what this material was like, what the challenges uh, would be with uh, the handwriting, uh, deciphering the abbreviations and, and so on. Um, and um, we also asked her to to then um, produce a, a scoping report that would kind of set out the kinds of things that we might do, how we might go about doing it, who would be involved, uh, what um, the, the sort of considerations might be for Canterbury Museum uh, in, in setting up something like this. So um, she, she wrote about sort of the suitability of the McDonald Dictionary uh, and kind of identifying the things that uh, would be worth doing, um, what the potential issues uh, might be, um, including thinking about um, uh, sort of the, any potential ethical or um, kind of um, copyright issues. Um, she had to produce um, some sort of project management um, sort of scoping material uh, and uh, summarise what the options would be in terms of potential software that we could use uh, for the project. She also had an academic side to the, to the um, project, um, so she was taking a, a stage two paper on uh, feminist history, so she brought a lot of her interest from that into this and kind of asked what kinds of sort of theoretical underpinnings would be most valuable to, um, to apply to the, to the project um, through that work. Um, we also, I should also acknowledge um, a lot of great work was done uh, by our developer, colleague uh, of ours, Antoine, um, who is here giving us a dramatisation of web development in action. Uh, he, um, he's a digital project specialist in the Arts Digital Lab at, um, at UC, and his, his main task was working out the data round trip, so taking um, uh, material from Vernon uh, and uh, getting it into a... Um, Pybossa, which is the, the platform we um, ended up using, which I'll say a little more about in a second, um, and then getting it back again. So kind of doing that, um, that plumbing work and setting up a web platform that we could sort of start to test some ideas uh, out. There was sort of a, a, a difficult balance, I guess, that I was exploring with this project uh, to do with um, how much could, could a student intern realistically do here? How can we involve someone who's not done this before um, in a project team where they get a real sense of, um, uh, of ownership and contributing something and learning new skills? Um, but you know, we, we don't want to do it for, uh, for them. We want to challenge them, but not challenge them too much, if that's um, a good way to put it. So uh, we were trying to strike that balance and not having done a project quite like this before, um, that was really one of the things that I was seeking to find out how we would do that. So having Antoine's support to do uh, a lot of the technical side of the setup and um, you know say, say no to things when uh, I, I was suggesting maybe we should um, bigger the project um, was, was really valuable. Um, so part of um, Phoebe's work with assistance from Antoine and, and interference um, from uh, the others in the team uh, was to assess different options for a technical platform and we looked at three things. Um, Scribe, which is a, um, a, a platform that's been used uh, quite extensively by the New York Public Libraries for some big projects that many people will have heard, heard of. Um, I believe the, um, the old weather project and um, measuring the Anzacs and some, some ones like that um, use it. Um, and Pybossa, which is another um, Python-based um, crowdsourcing uh, framework, and Google Docs for a sort of more, um, sort of easier to, to get up and running quickly kind of approach. And um, there were sort of ob obvious trade-offs uh, in the analysis that um, uh, Phoebe was able to do of these. Um, Scribe is very powerful, but we had some problems um, sort of really understanding it, getting to terms with it, and getting it running properly. Um, so it seemed like a bit of a, a sort of a racehorse in this kind of field, like it was perhaps a bit, had, had more features than we needed and a bit difficult to manage. Um, Google Docs would have been very easy to work with, uh, but would of course limit the ways that we could present the project and what we wanted to 
um, if we wanted to build this into sort of more of a public um, facing um, thing, then uh, we'd be limited. So Pybossa was a good sort of middle ground um, in terms of the options that we looked at. It's open source, it was fairly easy to install, had reasonably, um, reasonably good documentation that we could work with. Um, they also have a platform called crowdcrafting.org that's powered by Pybossa that you can use to get up and running um, if you don't want to host your own platform. So that was quite good. Um, so we made something that looks like this uh, and started, um, with Phoebe and Antoine mainly started working through the issues of um, uh, kind of how do, we, how do we get this interface to work, how do we write instructions for people that, that, that the most people will understand, um, how do we make it clear for the, for the widest audience. Um, so we had a number of challenges getting the image big enough to do transcription. Um, people are, are sort of going to be um, frowning at the screen, trying to work out McDonald's handwriting. So we needed to make it as big as possible. Um, and we went for actually not showing the whole image at once, just um, having, having a, a wide image that could be scrolled, um, in order that we could also have some form elements on the page and instructions on the page. Um, actually writing the instructions in a clear sort of um, direct way was a, was a challenge. Um, capturing alternative forms of a name, because particularly with the women listed in these cards, um, often there are multiple forms of their names. They have their husband's names, um, 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 maiden names, uh, and, and name variants. So we wanted to be able to capture all of those if we were going to do, uh, do this work. Uh, and there's some browser testing stuff that we need to do. So Antoine did a, did a great job of getting us started with a platform that we can use, but at the moment it only works on Chrome. So, um, yeah, future work there. We, um, we then did a bit of a trial um, to test our platform, um, and this kind of expanded um, the scope of the project sort of a little more than I'd really anticipated um, when we started it the, earlier in the year. Um, we did an... an Human Ethics um, Committee application uh, in order to um, run this as a research project through the university and if any of you have done those sorts of um, uh, ethics applications before that you'll know that that's a fairly, um, can be a fairly um, difficult process sometimes. We also um, initially targeted students to get students to participate in this um, and found that they are very difficult to motivate. Um, <laughs> So we sort of shifted tack and, um, and targeted um, colleagues and people whose arms we could twist much more easily um, uh, to, to sort of get a, get a group of people um, who we thought were you know, an appropriate audience who would be likely to be motivated to, to participate in something like this for real. Um, and we wanted to find out um, uh, really um, uh, what they thought about the interface and, and doing the task, but also why they thought the project was of interest and if um, this was something that they would do more of if they were interested in um, doing this because it, was a, it had a feminist history um, uh, perspective uh, or for other reasons. Um, and in terms of our findings with this small study, we got around um, 20 respondents um, who, who who did the task, um, used the website to transcribe a card and then gave us some feedback. Um, they found McDonald's handwriting difficult to, um, to read, so we do need to, um, I think we need to manage the expectations of this and recognise that um, there are people who are very keen to do this once they get the hang of it. So um, we want to do the best we can not to put people off early. Um, working with the dates is quite challenging. I think our interface didn't allow people to just put a year date, so they could put a, a month and a year or a day and a month and a year. Um, and so that's, that's a problem that's sort of tied up with browser, browser testing and, and other things, but that's, that was a challenge for us and something that, that um, users wanted to do, you know, do better, do more accurately. Um, interest in the feminist um, aspect of the project was strong. Um, there were um, a couple of people who didn't understand the question as we posed it, but um, for, for um, uh, the majority it was um, a motivating or an interesting factor to, uh, to be working on a project like that. Um, and really we need to do a, a bit more testing of our instructions in order to kind of um, make sure that the clarity is there. So there's quite a bit of future work um, that we've identified through doing this. Um, and as uh, 
Joanna pointed out, one of the things that we'd love to do here is to create links to other external resources. It raises questions about exactly how we do that, how we delimit you know, McDonald's work as a historical document um, in, in relation to you know, links out to other things that we might, that we might draw in that are relevant. Um, so you know, there are a number of, um, of interesting um, related materials on papers past that we could draw in. Interestingly, <clears throat> The Littleton Times um, uh, uh, article that McDonald actually cites that, that Joanna mentioned to you earlier um, hasn't been digitised, but you can find other materials that he didn't cite, um, such as um, obituary from the press and uh, from uh, and Carrie's obituary from the from the New Zealand Herald. Um, so there's a, a range of um, other materials that we might draw in here, um, and we'd be we'd be very interested to, to retest and sort of refine the interface next year to be able to capture some of these references and consider how we can use these additional um, sort of additional links that we might be able to create um, to papers past and other such resources uh, and um, also think about the existing subject index and other finding aids that exist um, at the Canterbury Museum and three or four large um, ring binder folders um, and what we could do to um, connect those um, to, the, to the collections online uh, as well. So the state that we want to get to, I'll ask Joanna if you want to say, say a little more about that. Sure. So when everything's all done, we hope that our collections online will look something like this. You can see the list of names has been greatly expanded. You can see all of Donald's family members, including the neighbor that he brought some land from, Mr. J. McClellan. The family Bible that was referenced on the second page is held privately, but you would be able to click on all these newspaper references here from the first page. And um, clicking on any of these names will bring up anything in Canterbury Museum's collections online that relates to that person, and hopefully People will also use this data to make collections past Canterbury Museum's collections online. And all these names will become nodes in a network. And who knows, maybe that network will even end up resembling a feather and fan pattern. Thank you. Thanks, it was a great presentation. Um, are you modeling the familial relationships or just capturing names? Um, not currently in this run. We did look at testing that, but it proved to be very complicated and it's not always clear. Yeah, Vernon has the capacity to store that data, but yeah. Yep. Would you use Pipe Osser again? We're just trying to choose a platform now for some geocoding, crowdsourcing, and Pyboss sort of rose to the top of the list from my early research, but good to get some feedback. It seems to be um, quite stable, quite easy to use, quite easy to get up and running. Um, sorry. Yeah. Um, so it seems to be quite, um, yeah, quite stable, quite easy to use, and get up and running fairly quickly with. Uh, we don't have a lot of... Um, technical expertise and we don't have a budget to kind of get a specialist to really dig into um, um, a new platform so we wanted to go with something that we felt was was going to be you know within our abilities and it's it, that seemed like a good good match for us yeah has it been around long uh, it's been a few years. I don't know exactly when it started. It's, um, it's mostly developed by a company called SciFabric who do, um, you know, kind of crowdsourcing and citizen science um, uh, provides sort of services on top of the platform. Uh, I think they're based in the UK. Mm. And in Spain. Oh, Spain, is it? That made it in Spain. Oh, right. Um, did you find with the trial that you needed to um, have an editorial eye over the results? Like, was there a need to kind of see what people were producing from the cards and make sure? Yeah. Yep, yeah. so we will be doing that. We just haven't done that yet because right. we finished the trial right before the conference. But we will yeah. do that. Yeah. And just another note, the Littleton Times will be... We did digitise them this year, aren't they? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it is coming. Yeah. Yeah. Nice, that fits yeah. perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> cool. 
Um, I was just curious. Um, it's a great resource that you're doing here, and I wondered whether there were thoughts to in future uh, link through to uh, you know Archives New Zealand's references to those people or um, to other um, you know Christchurch City Library's references and that kind of thing. There's definitely lots of opportunities, and I think after we finish this first trial and get it working and out to a broader public for tagging, I think that's when it's time to start thinking about other possibilities, and those are definitely on the list. Um, you know, with the, the scope of the cards that you had, did you find it more, less mind-blowing to bring it back down to a small portion of it, like the, the woman well, we will be tagging all the cards as part of the broader crowdsourcing project. That's just kind of like a theoretical focus for why we are approaching it. And of course, everyone's name will be tagged, but many of those people are women. As a McDonald, well done. <laughs> Anyone else? Hi. Um I was wondering, I was wondering uh, about uh, recognition of the contributions from the crowd um, as a way of, like, to use an, an outdated word at this point, but gamification to to reckon, to encourage people to do it more. So a leaderboard or levels that you can get to as a contributor. Um, yeah, perhaps like a comment. Um, so the reasons people gave why in the trial that we did why, as to why they would participate were uh, varied. Um, that sort of competitive aspect of it, or the gamified sort of aspect of it, didn't come up, though I don't think you'd expect that with the kind of question that we asked. Um, people talked about doing these kinds of projects because they find them you know, because they're sort of personally interested in the social history. Some people, one person talked about, you know, they find it relaxing and kind of, you know, um, uh, yeah, good for the, good for the, you know, um, clearing the mind to do some kind of this, this kind of work. Um, uh, yeah, Pybossa has a, a leaderboard kind of stuff that, that's sort of built into it that we could make use of um, to do that. Um, so it's something we could look at at a future stage, yeah. One last question. I was going to ask the same question as him, but I'll now ask a different one. Uh, what's the schedule for sort of public release or going live or announcing it to the world or moving to uh, full function? Um, we don't have a schedule yet. As you remember, we finished the trial right before the conference, so we have to, after we get back to Christchurch, we've got to go check the if anyone else has participated in between and very carefully review that feedback and then make a schedule. Um, and I guess I'd say we want to figure out how we can develop this as a teaching project. So that's, that's sort of prime been, been my uh, motivation for, and, and one of my motivations for doing this is working out how to integrate it with teaching and kind of keep it manageable and make it work for the students and meet certain learning outcomes. So we want to, um, sort of design a piece of the, the next steps that could be done next year and maybe have two or three students work on it rather than one um, to be a little bit more ambitious about the size of what we'll do. Um, but that has to be kind of flexible, that, that timeline, I think. Yeah. Cool. We're at lunch. Um, so, more round of thanks for the